check, 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 check. Check, 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 check.
Sorry, we're just waiting for the artist. The artist is not present. Now he is. Okay, so good evening, dear guests and friends in our auditorium and all of you joining us via live stream tonight. My name is Frank Baumann and I'm head of the program department, cultural department here at Goethe Institute in London. And I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of Goethe Institute London um, to um, uh, tonight's um, program. Thoughts in an eco-social eco energy transition conversation and manifesto. Convened by Thomas Saraceno, whose exhibition Webs of Life uh, will open, has opened today, but will be open to the public at the Serpentine South Gallery from tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, this evening we are here for a discussion on the struggle for clean and just energy between artists, thinkers, and activists. That's why I will leave this place in a minute. In my short time here at the Goethe Institute London, I have learned that the Serpentine Galleries and ourselves have uh, had many collaborations over the years, and my colleagues informed me about that. We cooperated in shared thematic areas, such as arts and technology, arts and ecology, arts and post-colonial discourse. And I'm very glad that tonight's program perfectly fits in. So we are grateful for this continued exchange and conversation with our peers and colleagues and friends, and delighted to welcome you all here this evening. So without further ado, I'm handing over to Lucia Pietro Justi, <laughs> head of ecologies at the Serpentine. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you have an inspiring and interesting evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Frank. Thank you to the Goethe. Thank you to Mario and Poppy and Ho and anyone I may not have mentioned just now um, for hosting us today. It's always a wonderful uh, feeling to feel this welcome in by your neighbors <laughs> uh, and long-term collaborators. So my name is Lucia. You've done it all, so I don't need to. And on behalf of Bettina Korek, uh, CEO, hans Ulrich Oberst, Artistic Director, the curators of the exhibition, Lizzie Carey Thomas and Chris Bailey, and my uh, dear friends and co-collaborators in putting together this event, Costa Stasinopoulos and Eva Spate. Um, it's a, a really an honor to be able to be here uh, today um, and uh, just really witness um, this the unfolding of today's event, which uh, is being held on the occasion of the opening of, indeed, Thomas Arsenos and collaborators uh, show at Serpentine. Now, I've had this conversation about 15 times last night <laughs> with many, many, many different people who came to see the, um, the, the preview of the exhibition, which was essentially to make the kinds of transformations towards environmental balance, towards environmental justice, that institutions, any institution really, but our institutions, because we're in this field and we're, we're, you know, this is what we're talking about today. Um, to make those kinds of transformations, it's hard, it's difficult. But when an artist comes in, <laughs> you're making the face that says, Tomas is making the face. I know it's difficult. But when, <laughs> but when, when an artist comes in and it becomes an artist-led project, it becomes part of an artistic vision, part of a vision really for the planet, then that become, makes things that here to seem impossible become possible. And I have read in both Graciela's and Maristela's beautiful texts for the Erosine newspapers, some statements that say pretty much the same thing, and I'm sure that we'll hear a little bit more about that tonight. Um, so, but the, so there's many, many, many aspects of Tomas and collaborators' projects uh, in the exhibition at Serpentine, but uh, what brings us today together is really a focus on the Erosine project, and particularly Erosine Pacha. The central film of the exhibition, which is also about it, and the frontline struggles in northern Argentina to protect access to water in the face of devastating uh, consequences of lithium mining. In January 2020, the fuel-free hot air balloon, Aerosene Pacha, um, 
uh, safely lifted a person into the sky and landed them back on Earth, I believe 660 meters forward, using only the power of sun and air. And this moment was organized by Tomas's Aerocene Foundation in collaboration with representatives from the 33 indigenous communities of the Salinas Grandes and Laguna de Guajratajoc Basin in northern Argentina. So the launch drew attention to the devastating impacts of lithium extraction on the region's human, but also non-human, more than human ecosystems, whilst proposing environmental and ethical commitments to the planet and to its inhabitants. We have a very busy program this evening. Uh, we will talk about the work. We'll talk about the work in relation to ecology. We will hear, and we're very lucky, in fact, to uh, be in the situation that we will hear testimonies directly from the front line. We will hear about a manifesto that was very crucial in the struggles, um, and we will hear about how human rights and environmental justice efforts come to meet. After this, everyone will join um, hans Eric Obrist, who will be moderating a conversation uh, where Tomas will also join. But without further ado, um, it's an uh, honor to introduce to you Graciela Esperanza, who is an essayist, a fiction writer, and a screenwriter, and uh, has recently written a book that is beautifully titled, I'm going to try in Spanish, Lo que no vemos, lo que arte ve. That is to say, the things that we do not see, the things that art sees. Thank you, Graciela, for being with us. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. First of all, thank to Tomas, to Lucia, to Hans for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here accompanying Tomas and his glorious, unprecedented project in the Serpentine Gallery. And also happy to be here together with Tomás, Maristela, Veronica, that, that will be joining us afterwards. And well, I'm going to read something because I only have 10 minutes, so I will do my best to, to take these 10 minutes to speak about Tomás' work and Tomás' work uh, in the show in relation to ecology as Lucia has said. So, two of the most pressing threats that loom over the planet and humankind, the environmental crisis and the unsettling immersion in a digital double of the world, respond to opaque and complex phenomena that mask their causes and the true dimension of their effects. Artistic imagination is then up to the task of lifting the veil, imagining an alternative model to the blind productivism that has brought us here, changing the scale and recalibrating our place in a world no longer centered on man, but open to multi-species cohabitation. But the question is, how can art become a model, a sounding board for less industrial hybris and more cooperation with a wider world. For more than two decades, Tomás Araceno, with collaborators from his studio and all over the world, has addressed this question, creating or recreating webs of life. In his work, the web is not only a metaphor, not only part of the title of this exhibition, but a real network expanded to address the threats I have mentioned before. Interconnecting them, Tomás has been facing both. Although sometimes invisible, abstract, or if material, extremely light, webs are the touchstone of his work, the master key to open the paths 
that connect art, nature, and technology. It all started perhaps with an early memory from his childhood. In the attic full of spider webs of the old Italian house where he lived as a child during his parents' exile in Italy, he wondered, were spiders living in his house or was he living in the spider's house? He could not have known at that time that the naive question was an anticipation of the increasingly evident reality of our utter entanglement with the more than human world and perhaps the seed of a fruitful entanglement in all his work. But again, how can art possibly interweave nature and technology? How can it embrace a cosmotechnics a technology situated historically, cosmologically, and locally. Since the naturalist Ernst Haeckel coined the term ecology in his general morphology of organisms, since the entangled bank of plants, birds, and insects Darwin mentioned in the famous final paragraph of On the Origin of Species, since von Wexkult's concept of unbelt, the environment that organisms create. Ecology is a science of interrelationships, a web. And if ecology is the study of the environment and the relationships therein, technology is the study of what we do there, human craft in a material world. Technology, in fact, created its own web to connect human beings at a global space, scale, the World Wide Web, the Internet. But we should now try to connect these two isolated networks, discover an ecology of technology, as British writer and artist James Bridle suggests, and I'm going to quote him. Every discipline discovers its own ecology in time. He writes in his inspiring ways of being, as it shifts inexorably from the walled gardens of specialized research towards a greater engagement with the wider world. However, technology is perhaps the last field of study to discover its ecology. And it is a deep paradox that it should have taken so long for technology to acknowledge ecology, or rather to discover it within itself. Art can then help to transform technology, contribute to the imagination of technological development, coming to terms and learning from other intelligences and from the environmental knowledge encoded into indigenous history. We are investing a lot of time and energy in developing artificial intelligence, a kind of toy version of our own minds, while we have consistently downgraded other forms of intelligence that do not resemble our own narrow definition, and ignored as well Amerindian cultures and their non-anthropocentric understanding of the world. Ecological thought, once unleashed, Bridal also writes, permeates everything. And Thomas's work has proved to be an extraordinary platform for this unleashing and this permeation. For decades now and here in the show, his art has shifted from the world spaces of research to interdisciplinary collaboration, from the solitary space of the artist in his studio to a never enlarging team of collaborators on land and in air, from Anthropocene to Erocene, from the corporate extractive damaging path of the internet and its dark cloud to airy cloud cities and webs of life, from solar balloon and fossil fuel free flights to Pacha, 
a locally situated collective project with indigenous communities of Salinas Grandes and Laguna de Huayatejo, who are fighting against industrial lithium mining in their ancestral lands. Here at the Serpentine Gallery, the exhibition itself ha has also shifted from the walled and energy consuming spaces of museums and galleries to an open space reliant on solar power that welcomes all kinds of species promoting new encounters. And with its time living sculptures, it has also shifted from the fixed times of an exhibition program to the nesting cycles of birds and the changing of the seasons. In solidarity with the indigenous communities of Salinas Grandes, visitors are invited to leave their mobile phones, give the lithium battery and artificial intelligence a break, and encounter other ways of knowing. In the meantime, Unleashing Ecology, the morphology of his artistic organisms, the umbelton of his own creatures, has also changed. Here we are in the serpentine. <laughs> and here then some visual evidence from networks made of nylon rope inspired in cosmic simulations and spider webs to real spider web sculptures to arachnocosmic concerts to spider divination sessions in Somie Cameroon and here at the Serpentine to a confessional box where you are invited to listen to spider vibrations and learn from its wisdom. And then from solitary flights to Museo Solar, balloons made of thousands of recycled plastic bags all over the world to the many world records, as Lucia has said, set by the Aerocene Pacha flight in Salinas Grandes, and a long-standing relationship with indigenous communities and their battle for environmental justice. And also from flying gardens, airport cities, to aerosolar virtual journeys, to Cloud Imagination, a collective work made together with a pareidolic imagination of children from Salinas Grandes communities. From Cloud Cities on a Roof Terrace, to Nested Ecologies in a Park and Inside a Gallery. And we could go on, but I think that my 10 minutes are up. So to finish, I'm going to quote Lynn Margulis. She said, life did not take over the globe by combat, but by networking. And I think that with his ever expanding web of connections, giving material entity to metaphors and to human imagination, creating an immersive laboratory in a world no longer centered on man, but open to multi-species cohabitation, Saraceno has demonstrated that an ecology of technology is not only due, but possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Graciela. I apologize, it's true, 10 minutes did feel incredibly short, especially listening to you, so my <laughs> profound and personal apologies about that. Um, it is now um, 
a pleasure to introduce Maristella, I believe, no? Thomas has redone the running order, so I'm just double checking. <laughs> Um, so Maristela Svampa, a sociologist, a writer and researcher, uh, has written about neo-extractivism in Latin America, but also been an incredibly powerful advocate for the rights of people and places um, throughout Latin America, um, is one of the uh, co-authors of the Manifesto for an Eco-Social Energy Transition from the People of the South, which is uh, the manifesto that gives tonight its name. Um, and that you can hear, read by the filmmaker and artist Mantia Diawara, if you jump on some of those bicycles that you will find outside of the Serpentine and start to cycle. So, Maristela, please. Okay. Oh. In the water. Uh, okay, good evening everybody. Uh, thank you for coming here. Um, I'm very happy to be here with Tomas, uh, big uh, creator, big artist, uh, with Veronica from Salinas Grandes, and Graciela, and Wolfgang too. So, and my colleagues uh, from the delegation, South South delegation. <laughs> So, uh, you know, three years ago we entered a, a period of lockdown because of COVID. Uh, let me remind you that in 2020, numerous eco-social transition proposals emerged. Some of them already existed and were updated. The objective of this proposal was to open the horizon to put on the agenda the issue of social inequalities and the environmental crisis. Issues such as basic income, the cancellation of foreign debt uh, to the countries of the global south, and the articulation between social justice and environmental justice were the core of debate. Now in 2023, we are living a civilizational poly crisis. It is not only the acceleration of climate crisis, the economic recession, the increase of inequality and the expansion of the far right, but also the war, the culture of war, the energy crisis, and the nuclear danger, all deeply associated with capitalism and colonialism. The war in Ukraine contributed to the exacerbation of both traditional extractivism and new extractivism associated with the so-called green transition, the decarbonization process in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So what is new at the moment is the North clean energy transitions that put even more pressures on the global south to extract cobalt and lithium for the production of high-tech batteries, balsa wood for wind turbines, several critical minerals for transition, land for large solar panels and new infrastructure for hydrogen mega, mega projects. This market-based export-oriented decarbonization of the rich opens a new phase of environmental dispossession of the global south. Thus, the global south has once again become a sacrifice zone, even a reservoir of, of superstory inacceptable resources for the countries of the North. As the Eco-Social Pact of the South in 2022, we, begin, uh, we began to be aware of these changes. That is why we started to meet with other activists from countries in the South, Africa, Asia, and of course, Latin America. We realized that there was increasing resistances that, uh, to the so-called green transition associated with many mega projects. Uh, as we understood that uh, there was a single global model, with, yeah? Okay. As we understood that uh, there was a single global model that was being imposed vertically, we quickly, quickly tried to build a common position. This does not mean that there are not differences between the countries from the South. 
However, we believe that there is a common framework that allows us to talk on energy colonialism. That is why we wrote this manifesto for a just transition uh, for, the for the people from the South. We consider that the, the type of energy transition being implemented has three major elements. It is corporate, neo-colonial, and unsustainable. Corporate, there are actors who confronted with the climate situation are seeing in the energy transition potential for wealth accumulation and geopolitical hegemony positioning. Beyond the business sphere, the corporate energy transition may have uh, diverse supporters, such as multinational companies, states in their multiple scales, institutions, and organizations. Many defend this concept as the fastest way to respond to the urgency of the crisis based on the idea of technological efficiency. The corporate uh, energy transition is based on the idea of sustainable development and the green economy. That is, on continuing the path of growth without the limits of exchanging fossil resources for renewable and high-tech resources without modifying the capitalist consumption uh, logic. Moreover, it does not question the distribution or access to energy for population or citizen participation in decision-making processes. Second, it is neocolonial, since it is a matter of ensuring the supply of critical minerals for the transition to the rich countries. To this end, there is a clear commitment to guarantee legal security to capital with regulatory and legal basis that make possible the highest corporate profitability. That is happening, for example, in the new bilateral trade agreements that the European Union is negotiating, among them with Chile and Mexico. It has incorporated chapters on energy and raw materials to guarantee access to critical minerals for the transitions. Now, the European Commission presented a proposal for a critical raw materials regulation uh, 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 ostensibly aimed at ensuring a secure and sustainable supply of critical raw materials for the European Union. However, this proposal will exacerbate the risk to human rights, indigenous rights, and the environment, undermine economic dynamics in partner countries, and continue to reinforce a sustainable consumption in rich countries. Finally, is unsustainable, this transition. The post-fossil transition cannot be used as an excuse for consolidating or continuing to maintain consumption models that are openly unsustainable. It is not enough to replace fossil fuels based cars with electric cars. It is necessary to reduce consumption and move toward public and shared mobility models so that they become sustainable. The fact that lithium batteries, as well as wind and solar projects, also require minerals such as copper, zinc, uh, among others, warns us of the need to carry out of radical reform of the transportation of the transportation system, and in general of the consumption model. Lithium extraction is a leading case of this kind of energy transition. The concentration of the energy system is an inherent characteristic of it. Large companies, not only private, but in many cases public, hold the hegemonic power. At the end of the global value chain, chain are all the auto giants, Toyota, BMW, Volkswagen, Audi, Nissan, General Motors, electrical firms like Vestas and Tesla, 50% of the battery for the automotive industry are concentrated in company in, chi in China. Add to this, the control of the extraction is also dominated by a few companies. Lithium extraction is a, is a, is a mining that fundamental, uh, fundamentality, sorry, that is fundamentality water mining. Its extraction in brine requires the consumption of unsustainable amounts of water in an arid region. This put at risk the fragile ecosystem of the desert is 
wildlife and the livelihoods of, of the people who live there, especially indigenous communities. On the other hand, a commodity, lithium, lithium carbonate, with that added value is exported. From Argentina or Chile, there is no control of the global lithium chain from salt flats to batteries. That fa the fact is that in Argentina as well as in the Atacama region of Chile, due to water consumption, lithium extraction threatens to break the fragile water balance. It tends to dry up aquifers and water reserves in areas that are already characterized by aridity and hydric stress. It also competes for water with the agricultural and grazing activities of the local indigenous communities that have inhabited the territory for millennia. In many cases, lithium extraction has advanced without social license, that is, without the agreement or consultation of the communities. In Las Salinas Grandes, in Jujuy, the 33 communities do not want the lithium extraction in their territories. They defend a holistic and ancestral perspective, the relational narrative linked to the ideas such as good living, territory, autonomy, plurinationality, water and sustainability of life. The salt flats are considered by indigenous people as a living being, as a giver of life. The slogan is water and life are worth more than lithium, as it could see it reflected in the volume that Tomás Saraceno raised in January 2019, shortly before the pandemic. In January, to, uh, in January 2023, five uh, months ago, we traveled again with Tomás Saraceno and several Argentine writers, environmental lawyers, and soil scientists to the earth of the Puna, Alfarcito, where after two days of intense exchange and dialogue of knowledge, we attended the elaboration of a declaration of the indigenous communities in favor of declaring the basin of the Salinas Grandes, the Laguna Guachatayoc, as a subject of right, as a subject of right. So, it is not that we in the Global South do not consider the decarbonization process to be important, but we think that the decarbonization is necessary, but it's not enough. We must point to a way out of commodification and not consolidate new forms of extractivism and areas of sacrifice in the Global South. People in resistance have called these false solutions supported by energy colonialism or green extractivism. For us, transition must be understood in a holistic and comprehensive way as a systemic process that aims at a change of the socio-ecological regime, that is, a transformation of the factors and elements necessary for life. The eco-social transition implies a radical, democratic, and democratizing transformations at the energy, productive, and urban levels, not only energy, but also productive and urban levels, towards models that articulate social justice with environmental justice toward economic and productive practices based on reciprocity, complementarity, and care toward a new pact of nature. In this framework, we call energy transition the passage from a conception of energy as a commodity, as fossil matrix, as having serious impact on the environment, private and concentrated, to another one that conceives of it as a common good, renewable and sustainable in the full sense, common and decentralized. Therefore, it is not only about decarbonizing, decarbonizing the energy model, but also about transforming the production model and more generally, the system of social relation and the link with nature. So our starting point is to think energy as a right and a common good. In fact, almost all of it comes from the mother source, the sun, the webs of life, as Thomas Saraceno's works shows. So 
it is also a matter of, of answering more elementary questions. For whom a why produce, uh, sorry, for whom a why produce energy? Who will pay the cost of the energy transition? What does the energy transition have to do with participation from below and more specifically with democracy? More general, what kind of world we want to build in our damaged planet? In short, we understand that the eco-social transition must be associated with global climate justice. So, to finish, we know there are many perspectives about energy transition, not only one. We don't have a manual with uh, all the answers. However, we have a guide, we have a, com a, a compass, a map connected with social environmental struggles, with local communities in resistance, with indigenous people, with eco-territorial feminism in the South, with narrative, imaginaries, practices of resiliency, talk about the defense of water, right of nature, and the commons. Thank you very much. Maristella, thank you so much. I think there was something incredibly powerful that you said, what kind of world do we want to build on this damaged planet? I thought it was incredibly poetic. And it's really, you're talking about building a world so that it matches a little bit more how the planet actually is, uh, aren't you? You're talking about interconnection, those webs in the title of your show, Tomas. The notion that interconnection also means mutual responsibility and obligation. Um, and in, in, that, in that context, uh, I think one of the things that came up in your talk and that will come up uh, for sure with, with Wolfgang now is, um, is, of course, how do we navigate the relationship between what we feel to be individual responsibility and what are those massive systemic changes in the face of which we can quite often feel quite power powerless just as we feel implicated by, for example, holding a phone. So, um, to that end, we're going to ask a big question about a big system, that is to say the legal system, and it's a, a big pleasure to introduce Wolfgang Kallick, um, a lawyer. He is the uh, founder of the European Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights, um, and one of your most recent books is uh, Law Versus Power, Our Global Fight for Human Rights, and I think if you ask, if we will, as we will later ask you some questions about some cases that you've been involved with, you'll find out that he's been involved in some quite important uh, once. So thank you so much for joining us and speaking to us about the relationship between environmental thriving and human rights. Yeah, thank you very much, Lucia, and uh, thanks to Thomas and Serpentine for the honor to speak here. Um, I'm happy that, um, Thomas, you finally included lawyers in your interdisciplinary community. <laughs> Um, although I note that um, we are listed behind the, the children, the ornithologists and the spiders, but I don't take it personal. Um, I mean, um, please don't misunderstand me, and I think it's, um, it's, it's important to, 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 to reiterate that um, lawyers and law and court won't heal the world, although some of the people who are struggling against climate change and for environmental justice um, have a certain naive and idealistic belief in that. Um, and so I, I want to re re deconstruct that naive belief um, and also to reiterate that law and justice is not a monopoly of the lawyers. It's all, that's something we have to strive for all together. Um, and moreover, I think I don't have to remind you, but I do it, uh, lawyers are often part of the problem rather than the solution and uh, one of the best uh, best uh, explanations for that is um, uh, New York professors uh, New York professor Katarina Pisto's book The Code of Capital um, where she explains in detail that the lawyers of this city London City and Manhattan um, coded the the code, code of, uh, constructed the code of capital means the completely unjust world economic order is also constructed by the lawyers, by tax law, by uh, trade law, and by, uh, by you, you talked about the bilateral um, 
um, uh, uh, treaties, and so on and so on. And so that's, and she gives us the task to deconstruct that and make labor rights, um, make social rights, uh, make women's rights and environmental rights um, much stronger. And so um, although lawyers are not, you know, the center, shouldn't be the center of this struggle, but it's very clear law is, is an important battlefield. And it's important, and that is why, how I understand my role here, it's important to know this field, and it's also important to learn from, from historical struggles. Um, because, I mean, there are, there are many claims right now um, to establish new laws, to stop climate change and to prevent further environmental damages. And I just mentioned the, the new provision, ecocide, you know, parallel to genocide. I mentioned rights of the nature and so on. But um, this won't be enough. And um, to give you one very striking example, um, and that's also, thank you very much, uh, Lucia, that you mentioned the book Law versus Power, because this is it. It is versus power. And uh, we can see we, this year, some will celebrate, some will uh, make some critical comments on the 75 years of the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a real utopian vision of how, how the world could, could be constructed. And you know, the colonial minister of this country, Mr. Creech Jones, called the Universal Declaration a source of embarrassment. Why did he do that? Because at the same time as the nations, the winners of the war against my beautiful country, Germany, um, Netherlands, France, Belgium, uh, the UK and others um, were involved in, in colonial wars, um, this, the period of the contested decolonization. And they, while they, they were rightly and not enough uh, putting war criminals, German war criminals on trial, they were, they were committing war crimes in Congo, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, and in many other countries. And moreover, when this decontest, contested decolonization ended, in, in, in formal and political sovereignty of the, of the, of the former colonial states, the, 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 they were asking for a new world economic order. And this is what not happened. And this is, until now, one source of, 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 of all the damages we are discussing in today's evening. And moreover, it's even getting worse. And um, I want to quote um, 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 uh, Thomas. Um, who, had, who said it in a much more poetic way, but he said, the air we are breathing is not the same. And, how, 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 and, and that's something which is also to be reminded in this we're sitting all the same boat, COVID paradigm, because it's very clear, all of, all of us who were sitting here, um, most of us were incredibly privileged. And those who suffered from COVID um, were not breathing the same air because, you know, you know all the statistics. Um, it was much more polluted, um, and they were um, physically, um, healthy-wise, much more pre-damaged. And so, um, and we can we can see the same inequality um, in the climate um, crisis. And I only recommend you this wonderful piece of work. The, crime, the Climate Inequality Report 2023, which you can download on the internet, and you find um, many interesting facts that, amongst other, the global 10% are responsible for almost half of the global carbon emissions, and especially when you see it historically, the colonial period. Um, and, you know, these questions are not at all answered in all these climate summits. The question, who caused this mess? And who's paying for it? Who caused it and who's paying for it? Um, I mean, we could go on for, for hours to talk, to discuss that, but I wanna, what I, I wanna talk about the um, very instructive example of Salinas Grandes, where you can really uh, uh, see it on, the, on a much more concrete level. I'm here as a German-based, European-based lawyer. Um, there, are, there are lawyers in Argentina who are accompanying this struggle and know much more. So I apologize, but um, anyway, the, the, it, we don't need new rights. All these rights we're, we're discussing, the rights of the indigenous people are, are uh, enshrined in the UN Declaration. Um, the right to, uh, to, to clean water, 
is enshrined in the Argentinian Constitution, in, in, many, in many international UN, uh, UN conventions, in the uh, convention of the, in the um, um, ILO, the International Labour um, um, Organization. So it's not about the existence of this right, it's about the access to justice. The access to justice. You know, t talk to them, and maybe um, um, Veronica um, and, uh, is, is talking about it. It's how, 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 how do you organize their struggle, their way from here to the courts in northern Argentina in Jujuy, a very conservative region, a very repressive region, to Buenos Aires or to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. That's a challenge today. And I mean, they, if you have read the, uh, the, 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 the paper for this exhibition, you will, form, uh, you will find on page two the right to an informed and prior consent. That means participation. Participation of the communities who live here, which is also a human rights. And it's long, long, long es established. But it's completely ignored by national courts. And again, the right, the, the, the access to, to justice is, 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 is a real problem. And on the top, and that's something I, I just learned these days, on the top, the repression. You know, while uh, we are celebrating these two brave uh, community leaders, the police cars are showing up in, the, in their villages. And, and of course, it's, this will cost them a lot. Maybe their liberty, maybe uh, many resources, and these resources are not more um, than uh, uh, available for their, for their struggle for, the, for their rights. What, what follows out for us? I mean, I wanted to talk about, about the, the EU, and then I realized oh, th this is the wrong place, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I use it in an example, apologies. But I mean, um, uh, Maristella just mentioned and, and, and gave me the Critical Raw Materials Act, uh, a, a briefing from, from the European Union, and it's ridiculous. It's 12 pages of anxiousness of the European Union countries, you know, what, what, what raw materials they need. And I, you know, I needed like two minutes and I was saying to Maristella, is there any mentioning of human rights? No, there isn't, there isn't. So we have 2023 and the European Union, the Peace Nobel Prize winner, um, European Union, those who are fighting for, a, for an international order, you know, dominated by, by rights, and by international law, not at least in the Ukraine, those um, dare to come up with a, with, with, with a concept, you know, which is well described by Eduardo Galeano in the open veins of Latin America. And I can't believe it, I can't believe it, I just can't believe it. So um, we have a lot to do in this regard. On one hand, it's of course, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm so, so, so happy um, to be here with Thomas because we share the, the idea of concrete utopia. Mine is the concrete utopia of human rights and he has a, another concrete utopian um, vision. So the concrete about the concrete utopia of human rights is the struggles, is the struggles. And that is something um, I think Thomas builds the bridge with, with exhibitions, with events, with the whole series he, he in Serpentine has, has planned for the upcoming months. Um, if you really mean it serious with climate justice, with environmental justice, you have to throw yourself into these concrete struggles. You have to show solidarity um, with the communities of Salinas Grandes. You have to, to, to strive for accountability for European companies who are co constantly and continuously causing this disaster. And we have to, and um, that I understand you're also a fighter for real intersectionality, uh, Thomas. Means we have to build up new co new coalitions between all the all the professions mentioned uh, um, today and yesterday. Um, but also, of course, art, art, cultural institution and artists play an important role. And it not by, it's not by chance that challenges for this completely stupid and damaging concept of private property comes from artists and comes from indigenous communities. So that is something I would say that's the utopian part of this discussion, that we have to challenge the concept of, the damaging concept of, of private uh, property and have to build up a new thoughts about cooperation, about collectiveness, uh, about communities. Um, and um, yeah, I would say I leave it by that. Thank you very much.
Wolfgang, thank you very, very much. Uh, it is now an enormous pleasure and indeed an honor to be welcoming Veronica Chavez, the president of the, communi uh, the community of the Santuario Tres Pozos and a crucial collaborator in the Aerocene Pacha project. It was a very long trip, uh, one for which we are extremely grateful that you are here to speak uh, to us to bring a testimony directly from those frontline struggles and to just speak the truth. So thank you so much and thanks to Kami who will be translating as well. Oh. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Verónica Chávez, soy de la Comunidad Santuario de Tres Pozos. Estoy ejerciendo como presidenta. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Verónica Chávez. I come from the community of Tres Pozos, and I'm representing the community here. Mi territorio de mi comunidad queda en el territorio de Salinas Grande, Laguna Guayatayó, donde ustedes lo pueden observar. The territory of my community is the Salinas Grandes and the uh, Lagoon of Huachatayoc, and is what you can observe in these images. Estoy muy agradecido todo, con todos ustedes, especialmente con Tomás Araceno, que hoy me da la oportunidad de poder visualizar mi problema en mi, de mi territorio. I'm very thankful for, uh, to all of you and especially to Tomás that he is giving me the opportunity and the community the opportunity to display here today the struggle of all our community. En el territorio de Salinas Grande, Laguna Guayatayoc, somos más de 40 comunidades originarias, 7,000 habitantes. In the territory of Salinas Grandes and Laguna Huachatayoc, we are more than 40 uh, Aboriginal communities that we live there, and this is our territory. And we are more than 7,000 people. The problem that we are teniendo, we have this lucha, son más de 13 years en la lucha en defensa del territorio y defensa del agua. The struggle that we are having for more than 13 years is the defense of our territory and the water of our territory. Nosotros estamos defendiendo el agua, el territorio, porque en ese territorio vivieron nuestros abuelos, nuestros tataras abuelos que hoy están en el cielo y el agua que ellos dejaron un territorio sano y limpio para nosotros. Y nosotros ese territorio queremos dejar para nuestras generaciones que vienen. We are defending our territory because, uh, and the water of our territory because it's a territory of our fathers and grandparents that it has been for many generations and they left it a uh, clear and pure and we want to defend it as clear as pure as it was for our future generations. No estamos de acuerdo con la extracción exploración de este mineral que se llama litio porque consume mucha agua dulce y agua salada. We are not uh, happy with, disagree with the exploration and extraction of this mineral called lithium because it uh, consumes a lot of uh, both uh, potable water that is underneath and uh, salty water that is on the surface to extract the mineral. Y el gobierno que nosotros tenemos, que se llama Gerardo Morales, de la provincia de Jujuy está violando todos nuestros derechos sin el consentimiento de nosotros esta 
haciendo las aprobaciones de pactos ambientales. The government, headed by our governor that is called Gerardo Morales, is violating every right that we have for the territory and is do, uh, doing approvals without our consent to make all these explorations possible. Queremos visualizar la lucha porque nosotros no queremos este, la exploración de litio. Queremos que nuestras generaciones que vienen, que encuentren nuestros territorios sanos como hemos encontrado. We want, uh, we are against the extraction of this mineral because we want to continue having our territory as clear as possible and we want to keep it as clear as possible uh, for the future. En nuestro territorio vivieron nuestros abuelos, tenían su economía que era la ganadería, las artesanías, la agricultura y la cosecha de sal. Y nosotros estamos haciendo lo mismo. Ahora se presentó otra oportunidad para nuestro territorio, a donde Salinas Grande, a donde ustedes ven ese hermoso lugar, tenemos visita de turismo que llegan del mundo. Uh, our grandparents had like a local economy based on the uh, agriculture, but uh, reduced agriculture, but also like uh, the agropecuarian industry, a small industry of like, ¿qué animales son llamas? the llamas, uh, and also like the salt extraction from the surface and crafts that are local for the site, and they want to continue, and also because of the landscape, it's a very rich uh, landscape to be visited by tourists, and they want to continue this kind of economical uh, productive model, not the lithium one. Las comunidades cuando ellos desarrollan un proyecto productivo es igualdad para toda las, la gente de la comunidad, no es como las empresas mineras que van. Whenever the communities create an economical model or project for the site is uh, egalitarian or uh, in equal parts for all the 40 communities and not the model that this big mining industries are proposing that all the profit is for the companies. Cuando hay un proyecto productivo, las comunidades somos beneficiadas de los 18 años hasta la edad que ellos puedan hacer el, el trabajo. Whenever there is a production uh, project between the communities, everyone from 18 until they are retired, until they are old, all are benefited from these uh, community projects. Mientras las empresas mineras que van, no. Ellos nos discriminan, agarran a edad de media, a donde nos hacen algunos Examen, si no servimos, si no damos para el trabajo, no deja nublado. On the other hand, the companies have this economical model that they choose only the people that is able to produce between certain uh, age ranges and they even examine them and in case they are not capable of doing the job that is required for the mining, they are completely discarded. Bueno, con esto nosotros estamos totalmente de desacuerdo y queremos seguir viviendo como han vivido nuestros abuelos y también dejar un territorio sano para los que vienen. We are completely against this kind of model and we are struggling and we are fighting to continue having the model of our ancestors and to continue using and producing in our territory in the same way and living a clear and pristine territory for the future generations. Bueno, le pido a todos los presentes que visualicen mi problemática de mi territorio de Salinas Grande, Laguna Guayatayoc. I ask to everyone that is present today to 
help her and to make visible and to see the, the project and the struggle that they are having to fight for the communities of uh, Laguna Huachatayoc. Nosotros lo queremos hacer visualización estos problemas porque el gobierno siempre no está con la policía por nuestro territorio cuando ellos quieren entrar. She wants to make this project visible for everyone because the local government is a, is a, sorry I forgot the word. It's always with the police trying to uh, take them down and take uh, down this protest uh, to continue uh, being on the side of the companies and to make these struggles invisible for the everyone else. Lo hace porque él nos quiere dividir y nosotros lo pedimos que la consulta previa, libre y informada, tiene que ser colectiva porque se trata tema de agua. He wants to repress all these protests because he wants to make this invisible, invisible because all the, the polls that should be done before these projects with the local communities should be open and he's avoiding to make this open to everyone and just to the, divide all the communities to have like a certain way of view that is on behalf of the companies. Bueno, gracias a todos por haberme escuchado. Ahora que estoy aquí, gracias, don Tomás. Y bueno, espero tener el apoyo de todos. Finish. Uh, she was thankful, as you might have noticed, uh, she's thankful to everyone here, especially to Tomas, and she's asking your support to make this struggle visible for everyone, and also, I think, to join the manifesto through the QR codes and the website. She didn't say that, but I mean, you can join the <laughs> website that, uh, that is of, la of the territory. Yeah, the Laguna Huachatayoc Territory website is all available online, so you can all join the struggle and all to, to be more informed. So please Google it if you don't know how to. It's Salinas Grandes, and you will see the manifesto and everything. <laughs> And I also want to introduce to Natividad that is also the president of other of the communities, the local communities of the territory. ¿Quieres decir algo? Sí, sí, sí. Lo que quieras decir. ¿Qué quieres decir? Mi nombre es Natividad Vilte. También soy de la provincia de Jujuy, y bueno, Argentina. Y bueno, agradecer más que nada a Tomás, yo creo que um, da fuerza a esto. Y bueno, que nos conocimos hace cuatro años atrás. Y bueno, eh, soy, represento también, soy presidenta de una comunidad que estamos trabajando junto con Verónica. Somos un grupo de trabajadores y que seguimos luchando para todo el territorio de las comunidades. She's Natividad, she's from one of the other co 40 communities that are in the territory and she works together with Veronica and uh, she thanks to Tomás for making this visible and uh, she hopes to continue 
uh, pushing and fighting against this, this problematic and this destruction and to make this problematic visible. Muchísimas gracias, Veronica, y Natividad. Um, we are just going to invite all of the speakers now to join uh, me, uh, well, to not to join me, but to join Hans Eric Obrist on stage. <laughs> I will sit back down. And um, so that's going to take us just 20 seconds so that we do the plasma all right. So um, look casual while we do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lucia. And I think before we start, we should give another big round of applause to our amazing speakers. <laughs> Thank you, Lucia, thank you, Costa, thank you, Lizzie and Chris, um, who are here. Uh, Bettina Korek and I and our teams also want to thank the Luma Foundation, Melania Navarro Leal, Picte, and of course, the incredible group of people who made this exhibition possible. We want to thank the Goethe Institute. And it's really fascinating that the very first event I remember um, we organized here, I think it was in 2006, was with uh, Jonah Friedman, a friend also of Thomas, the late Jonah Friedman. And he talked here in this very space about concrete utopia. So I think there's a wonderful connection here at the Goethe to um, concrete utopia. Kind of summarizing, I think, what Thomas has showed us, what you know, um, all the amazing speeches in terms of concrete utopia do. I was kind of thinking about Alexis Pauling Gams. And the amazing Alexis Pauling Gams wrote, we have the opportunity now as a species fully in touch with each other to unlearn and relearn our own patterns of thinking and storytelling in a way that allows us to be actually in communion with our environment as opposed to a dominating colonialist separation from the environment. And I thought, Thomas, maybe we could start with that because that has a lot to do with all your work in a way. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, no, I, 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 I just, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm famous not to answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, w what I want to say is like a, a little bit how, um, um, thank you, Gracilia, for reminding what I was doing before and, and what is happening now is, is always enlightening. But um, I, I want to think because the, the show is so much about uh, energy, you know, and this social energy that somehow the sun give us, but somehow we're able to give one to each other and to influence so much uh, the things we do and, and how our works change. And, um, and I, I just want to, it's, it's kind of a super um, big thank, uh, thanks, but, uh, but also how much um, all the speakers which uh, have been here today in all my studio, and my partners and, and the communities have um, changed a lot the way I think. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, for me very important. I think so when, um, and I want to mention a few, but uh, in many of the studios here, yesterday we did a marathon of, of naming all, and each of you, which I would really much to do it again, <laughs> to give me energy again. Um, 
but, uh, but what I can say is like, you know, like Claudia, I see, and Lars, and, and many friends, and Manu, when the, the studio start to shift a little bit, you know, and we start to, seven years ago, start to visit the communities, um, there was a, a, a sense of, uh, and then I, um, of, 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 a, of a change, of this maybe concrete utopia that Hans is calling, or the radical change, of start to see and sense something which was quite of a different. And then um, um, Maria Cohen, a friend, said, oh, you have to meet Graciela Esperanza. And Graciela said, oh, you are going to the community of Salinas Grandes, and you have to meet uh, Maristela Svampa. And, and then like this was one friend after the other that was never stopping. Uh, and then it, the, the just last gathering in, in Salinas Grandes, we organized it out of in, in two weeks, in three weeks, and everybody was paying his own ticket and everybody was coming up. Well, we, we support some, and, and I want to say, I don't know if it's uh, um, Eric Fremont also is here. Uh, from Eric and Caroline, which have support so much this show and make all this community coming together. But what I want to say is like was um, was something that when we were together clapping with with Vero and uh, and Natividad, that I think is contagious. There is something that it, it seems is, is unstoppable. Is that energy that um, that no and so obsessed about energy transition the solar panel, the lithium, leaving your phone, giving away your time, and, and people were so happy that they, they were forgetting the phone in the exhibition. <laughs> Believe it or not, I, I was six hours without phone, and then Hans sent me an email from somebody else who have, at the end of the exhibition road, seven blocks away, and then they forgot their phone for a bit of a time. And I mean, it seemed that that time is given to something else, to made it our time. Another time with other people and other connections, right? Is what I think so we are all struggling and asking today being here. Um, this means let's keep be contagious one to each other. I don't know, but it's, it's, a, it's something that, uh, that it, it, it made me incredibly happy. And, um, and I think so the other word, um, Vero, with your permission, Let's dedicate this to your father. Uh, hmm? The father of Vero uh, passed away three days before she traveled here. And we were <laughs> incredible. This means when we talk about ancestors, um, I think so we, we give a big round of applause to Vero, the father, and all what he has given us today. Hans and Bettina, and I know Hans since 20 years, that's the truth. Uh, I was his student in Venice, and I think so. Uh, long collaboration, I think so. Um, I think so, at least for me, when the invitation was there, uh, I think so. We, we all try to give the best of the best. Thank you, Hans, and thank you, Lucia, and thank you, everybody, my galleries, and <laughs> Lars, please help me if I forgot somebody. But the, the, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> and we, of course, also have to thank you know, the many non-human protagonists of the exhibition, because this exhibition has a lot to do with alliances, no? Of human and non-human actors. Can you talk about that? Because it's an important part of the show. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we go from one extreme to the other. But, uh, but yeah, I... Is this a web of relationship that I think so we have been talking, and, and you know my obsession with spider webs, and uh, and all the time still the obsession of from many humans, or many way of knowing, um, when when we when we confront the scientific knowledge with a traditional ecological knowledge, with situated knowledges of how much um, sometimes it's sort of an imbalance and. And from Hans' side, I think so what exhibition at least, I think so, and, and was so happy with, I want to mention also Rebecca Lewin, what was 
together with um, uh, Lizzie and Chris uh, creating this exhibition, uh, was putting at the centers and at the beginning of the show with uh, Pierre Bolo, um, and then the major spaces for the communities. Oh, I lost. Uh, this means it's a little bit to follow up this, um, um, for the one who follow more statistical work, no? that 5% of the, of the um, population of the world is represented by uh, First Nation people, indigenous communities, who are able to maintain and, and, and preserve 80% of the biodiversity of the planet Earth, 5% to 80. And that 5% have a different relationship with, uh, with the non-human world. Um, with spiders, some uh, do not suffer the phobias and the arachnophobias that this world or part of the world has. And this, I mean, I think so. The show, as much as it gives space to, to I think so, the non-human world is also, I hope so, give a very strong voice to the cultures and the community which still celebrate other ways of knowing, other ways of relating, our way of thinking that the family um, is larger that the human one now when you are there every single animal and plant have a personal name uh, napoleon is uh, the cow uh, and the and the llama have uh, and as a movie portrait and where is maximiliano Laina, the director of the movie which is there please a big round of applause to maximiliano <laughs> um, we are friends since more than 40 years with maxi uh, and uh, and I think so also have been contagious, this love to, and I and I think so he was one of the one who dragged me more of the, of the rhythm because when we were in Salinas Grandes, everything needs to be discussed for a very long time. There's the rhythms of doing the things which is completely different of the way we do like this. And Maxi will sit with the communities at the beginning, and talk for days, and hours an assembly after assembly. And I say, but we need to fly this country. We are there. Wait, wait. And again and again, discussion after discussion. Um, some trust was weave. Um, it's, it's the first time we were there was 2017, 20, 23. And then we have this group, uh, WhatsApp group that we keep alive uh, here and there uh, for the conversation. Forgot the question. But, um, but yes, um, many, we are many. There's no distinction between uh, humans and other animals, I think, so in many other cultures. There are many cosmovision that I think so we are trying to reweave uh, at, at large, I think so, and hope so in the exhibition. Thank you so much, Thomas. And that really leads to a question I have for Graciela, because of course, the exhibition very much goes beyond the space no, of, of the serpent time. We've never had an exhibition which so much opened up to the park. The park comes into the serpentine, the serpentine goes into the park. And that connects a lot to you know, what we are doing with many of our environmental projects with Back to Earth, where we have artist campaigns, you know, uh, where um, these campaigns go into society. It's something John Latham and Barbara Stevini talked a lot about with the artist placement group that we need to bring art into society. So I wanted to ask you, Graciela, in relation to the theme really of today of Concrete Utopia, what for you are the possible avenues available actually to artists in this time of environmental catastrophe to actually move outside the confines of the art institution? And not only that, but also, as Thomas does, to actually transform the art institution. Well, I think that uh, many artists have been sensible to this urgency in front of these threats. And I really think that art has the task to unveil uh, this uh, phenomena that are difficult to calibrate. And of course, I think that, I think that it was obvious that I think that Thomas is a, a kind of clear example that it is possible that you can really open the place of art to make or to transform it in a real laboratory of how this is possible. But I also think that there are other ways to do it. Mm? I think that uh, perhaps what uh, Tomás has done is uh, a kind of 
extreme metaphor of the opening of the place of art and opening the time of an exhibition. Uh, but I, I really think, as Lucia told you, I've written a book that is called uh, What We Don't See, What I See. So I, I trust uh, art because I think that um, art works with metaphors and works with scales and so it can open the scale and it can show this that we cannot see because all these phenomena are very big to be visible. Uh, it can represent this in another scale as by a simple fact of opening the doors of a gallery and let the space be inhabited by birds and dogs. I think that that can be an invitation to really think about that. And as Thomas said, uh, the simple fact of leaving the mobile phone for a couple of hours is a kind of training, propedeutics for the, <laughs> for the change. Uh, it's always difficult because it's a kind of addiction today and the risks are very high because we are really living in, in a kind of double of the world. And so I think that this can be a very useful exercise. Leave the phone there for, <laughs> for, <laughs> for a couple of hours and you can live without it. And so, uh, of course, I think that Tomás has been thinking these possibilities of art for a long time. And when I said that the web was a touchstone in his work is because I think that uh, he, he can no longer do something without this web, with collaborators, with other disciplines. And this, I think that in, in this moment of this urgency is very important. That's the, the key for, the, for <laughs> the very, very, very hard task we have in front of all this emergency. Thank you so much. Big round of applause. <laughs> And you mentioned, of course, the book, Loque no vemos, Loque arte ve, what we don't see, what art sees. And I think you summarized in such a wonderful way what art can do today. And I think it connects also in your book to another thing art can do, which is something already Paul Klee said, that actually art can make in a way that invisible, no visible. Mm -hmm. um, and this idea of what art can do brings us right away to Maristella Swampa. And, um, you know, wonderful talk you, of course, and as well also in um, many, many of your texts, you address actually the necessity of, for all of us, but for art particularly, to resist uh, green colonialism, uh, a discourse, as you said, you know, around falsely clean or renewable energy gives the global north the false impression that a future without degrowth is, is possible. So I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit more about how you see concretely, in terms of concrete utopia, possibilities for art to resist actually green colonialism uh, on an individual level, but also how could we can actually find agency within these you know, huge, e enormous systems, um, which so often feel kind of go beyond an, an individual's control. Um, it's not an, there is not an easy answer. Uh, First, because uh, I, 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 I don't know, but I prefer to, to think in collective terms, you know, not in individual terms. So uh, when we talk, in, not only with the manifesto, but uh, with my other colleagues and activists from Latin America in the Eco-Social Pact of the South, uh, we, we are connected with the uh, social struggles and especially with the communitarian and uh, social uh, resilience practices, okay? So uh, it's not only, uh, for example, uh, 
uh, is, 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 is not only the social struggle, there are uh, other reality uh, connected with the uh, life in the territory, uh, for example, uh, agroecology and, uh, and um, communitarian uh, experience uh, connected with the green energy and other examples, okay? So there, there are a lot of, lot of examples not connected between them, no? Um, in, uh, in, the, in, in the global south, not only in Latin America. So it's very inspiring that. It's very inspiring because uh, I, I, I think that uh, when we talk about uh, collapse and Anthropocene, it's not only a, a limit concept that uh, uh, refers uh, to the uh, natural and ecological limits of the planet. Uh, we need, uh, especially, uh, Anthropocene it has a, a lot of, have a, a lot of uh, political and, et and ethical and philosophical repercussion. We need to reveal our relationship with nature, okay? So that is the, the first question that I, I think. And in the different experience of the communitarian experience uh, in the South, uh, we perceive uh, other narrative, relational narrative. And that is connected with art too, because uh, in fact, uh, Thomas, uh, 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 the, the art of Thomas, uh, is very inspired. It's, it's a portal with other uh, narratives with nature. So, and uh, he talks about the other uh, sentient being, uh, not only human being, uh, and uh, he, he has a respect with the other narrat relational narrative, but especially I think that art is a portal, it's a possibility to think other relational narrative. We need to build uh, this kind of uh, uh, narrative, not only in the terms of imaginary, but in the terms of practices. Thank you so, so much. A big round of applause for Estela Swampa. Thank you so much. And that brings us to Wolfgang Kalleck. I wanted to ask you, Wolfgang, to tell us uh, more, because you spoke powerfully uh, of the legal struggles no? for environmental and human justice. And um, I wanted to know a little bit more in what way do climate and human rights litigation kind of intersect, uh, and what can art do in this space? Um, my claim is that uh, the... Um the fight for environmental justice and human rights um, should be should intersect and should be reconciled, and that's not always the case. Um, if uh, when we see that some of the major environmental organizations, I don't want to name them, um, but uh, declare territories in Latin America or in Africa as uh, as protection zones, and try and are evicting exactly the people. Thomas was speaking about the 5% um, who was in a way living with, uh, with the nature in a way the rest of the world w was not uh, capable today, um, then there is something completely wrong. Yeah, then there is something completely wrong. Um, and so therefore, um, we, have to, we have to measure every environmental measure um, with, with human rights, and especially with the rights of the indigenous people, but also other people. And then the other notion of the, of I would say, the European and probably uh, North American um, climate movement, which is mixed, um, we have to talk about the damages uh, people are already suffering um, um, from 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 the climate disaster. So we are not, and that's uh, that that brings me in a little bit in conflict with some some of the colleagues, let's say in Germany. We're not talking about the prevention, not only talking about the prevention of future damages. We have to talk about what's, what's damaging right now, the pollution right now. And, and then we have to talk about something. And I would say that is definitely uh, underestimated in the environment, environmental movement. We have to talk about reparation and we have to talk about colonialism. And that is not, I have, I'm, I'm not hearing that much, um, the word. And I think the word alone is necessary to put, to put it on the forefront. 
it's, a, it's, it's, it's in a way utopian because when you talk to the governments, um, it's, the, it's the R word. You know, they don't want to even spell it out. Uh, and therefore, I think um, arts, but, but also cultural institutions like yours are incredibly important. I mean, when, I, when, I, uh, when we started in, uh, in Germany to address the colonial genocide of the Germans in Namibia, um, none of the usual suspect of the human rights community was anyhow supportive. None of the funders who fund our incredibly important anti-torture work and the you know, accountability of cooperation work, that's important. None of them was willing to fund um, anything like that. It was the Academie der Künste, Academy of Fine Arts, it was the House of the Cultures of the World, and so on. And I think um, uh, also the fact I, uh, that just what, I'm, what I was saying, to challenge the concept of private profit property, that is something that unfortunately is not done by the legal community. If you, do, if, you, if you spell that out in the legal community and also in the mainstream human rights community, you're, you're out because that goes too far. You, you cross the limit. You cross the limit because you know, they would say no, our, uh, our, uh, our, uh, the stakeholders in government and the corporation won't swallow that. And this is exactly what this is about. And this is exactly why I'm saying we have to develop, uh, um, and some of you brought Bruno Latour's uh, uh, manifesto, and um, this is about um, naming those who are responsible for this mess and holding them accountable. And that is something that will cause a certain division. And we have to face that. We have to, we have to fight the power. And or you are willing to do that, or it's only symbolic. And therefore, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, 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 underestimating you know, symbolic and uh, uh, poetic approaches, but it, it, it's, um, the strength of Thomas' work is thing to, to combine this, to combine it. Um, so, and, and I think that's, that's something that has to be uh, much more strengthened than, 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 than it's now. Thank you so, so much. Big round of applause, Wolfgang Kalleck. <laughs> and thank you so very much, Veronica, for bringing us this amazing testimony from the front line of the urgent issues you've been telling us today and yesterday. Uh, and last night, you know, at the, at the opening, To you, what they can do uh, actually to best support your cause very concretely. So it would be wonderful to hear more about that because that was really a big, big question last night. At least 20 people asked me. Este, bueno, para ayudarnos nosotros es visualizar y también este, visualizar nuestra lucha que nosotros estamos haciendo y contactarnos con nosotros y tener un correo, algo cuando nosotros no, se vemos que estamos atropellados y nosotros le vamos a pasar toda nuestra problemática a, la, a, los, a los señores que nos quieren apoyar, cosa que esa problemática que está pasando en Salina Grande, cuando nos están arrastrando los policías, nosotros si comunicamos urgente con ellos para que visualicemos y eso y she says that the way to help her and the communities in this struggle and in the fight uh, uh, there is a topic of the word lucha that is like both at the same time in the translation fight and struggle uh, to make it visible. First off, visualize yourself the struggle, as we mentioned before, through the website and everything, but uh, to make it visible because you can get in direct contact with the community through different email addresses and everything. So in case, for example, the next time that the police is going there to take them out and to fight against them when they are trying to manifest themselves against these uh, corporations or everything, to make it visible through different media outlets, for example. So if you have the opportunity to make this struggle visible outside of the regular media channels that are in the local communities and to make it visible outside of it, it will be of great help for all the communities. Uh, 
este, nosotros también este, necesitamos ayuda de la economía para trasladarnos desde nuestras comunidades a las otras comunidades o también sea a la provincia de Cucuy, porque vivimos re lejos y no tenemos este transporte diario. Another way would be to support economically because uh, Jujuy is a very northern province in Argentina and the local communities are like far from the cities, from the capital city of the province. So a great support would be like to have means of transport to, uh, first of all, uh, community, communicate between the communities and to be able to trip and travel from one community to the other and then also to be able to uh, travel from the communities to the capital to make these uh, struggles or these fights more visible, I mean, having means of transport to move ar around the territory. Y también con la economía para pagar los abogados que nosotros necesitamos eh, casi todos los días y bueno, esa es una economía más fuerte que necesitamos nosotros. Sí. And also economically to support all the legal advice and the legal fees that they require every day to pay the lawyers that they need every day to fight against these uh, companies and the governor, not only the governor, but also, for example, the, the struggles that they have with the police when they are like arrested and everything because they need lawyers to have to be in the legal system that they are. So economical support for or even legal support in these cases will be like super important. Y bueno, por último, tenemos un proyecto, como le contaba, que tenemos el turismo que llegó hace seis años atrás. Y bueno, tenemos un proyecto para preparar para prepararnos todos para recibir al turista, que es una economía importante que llegaría a todas las comunidades con su propia gente. And the, also one last possibility is to support like going there as tourists because since many years in six years they are like preparing the whole territory to be able to receive tourists and to show them all the environment, the landscape and the territory, uh, and would be like a great support to make this territory available for tourists and to develop it touristically and to have like a local and a community economy, as she mentioned before, to support this. Ah, sí, el proyecto que lo estoy hablando son formar guía de sitio para poder recibir a los visitantes y bueno, mostrar nuestra linda cultura que tenemos, nuestros paisajes como Salinas Grande, Laguna Hueta, Yoc, Cerro Chañi, eh, tenemos muchas cosas bonitas. The part of this project that she's speaking out to is, is also like uh, educating local guys that they are able to narrate and to, to tell the story and the culture of the site, but also to show around the beautiful landscape and the amazing uh, views that they have and also like the amazing culture that they have to show to everyone there. A big round of applause for Veronica Chavez. <laughs> and I just wanted to uh, end by maybe saying also concretely, if people want to support, that there is a website, right, Thomas? Uh, yes, we are building it together. Uh, the name is very long. Uh, Territorios like. Uh, Salinas Grandes y Laguna de Guayatayoc punto org. Uh, then we have print many cards, no, Vero, en Natividad, maybe you can pick them up. These are the cards from the communities, whoever is interested, I think so you could 
Rich Natividad en Vero. The email address and part of the page is there. And this means I suggest that, um, yeah, it's a beautiful moment to exchange contacts and to talk each other and to get that. I kind of keep missing many people, Hans. I don't know how to say. But a couple of things. No, Claudia Waff also. She was so amazing. Uh, she wrote in a beautiful script that is in the movie. She's the voice of Lee, the lithium. I hope so. she's seeing us via the internet. Thank you, Claudia Waff. She was part of the, of, 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 uh, the meeting in um, Alfarcito. Uh, Kike Viale also was joining us there in the communities when we were there, sorry. Uh, Melissa Argento, uh, a, a fantastic also. Pia Marchesini, who is also been following in, in the communities. I don't want to forget about Mike also, our hero who helped us to put this show together. The Serpentine, your oracle, over 40 years working at the Serpentine. Um, yes, big, big, big uh, clap. Um, there's another person in Argentina, Joaquin Escurra. Let's not forget that uh, there is a huge community. It's called Aerosin Community. Uh, and then we work together for many years. I hope so. Uh, we join us under any name uh, we want, but there are many people who we have been working together. Ines Castelsen, also very important, that it came to the gathering that together with Graciela have been putting together this workshop uh, with the clouds imagination that you have seen that have been transported also at the Serpentine and we are working together toward a future artworks uh, all together with kids uh, from the Salinas and the kids here. Uh, let's not forget Pierre Polo, the spider diviner, um, and all the community of uh, of uh, Cameroon, also David Seitling, Edward Miller, Peter Yeager, the very good friend, arachnologist for many years. We have been working together. Um, all the arachnophilia community is another community like the Aerosin who have been working for so many years. Mantia de Aguara, I think so fantastic, who helped us to cross the manifesto with more voices, the bike project, Jane Lee. Then now I will close up with a big round of applause, but I think so, and please, is all the team of the studio. I see Thomas Charil over there. Please, Charil, hero, you put it all together. Alberto, please, stand up. Can you stand up, please? Let's go. I will do it quickly with a lot of energy. Uh, Ilka Tot, where is Ilka? Please lift up. Alberto Vallejo, Victoria Vos, Georgi Kachelevich, Kelly, Darío, Duncan, David Book, Florian, Sara, Lucia, Oli George, Vanessa Boni, Christian Flem, Max Pernell, Christian Vesrup, Claudia Melendez, Gillian Mayer, Lars Beren, Gustavo, Anya Sophie, Miriam, Tania, Olivia, Alfredo, Julia, Kessie, Jasmine, Patrick, Sasha, Matthew, Nemanja, Sven, Dick, Cristina, Alice, and my galleries. Neugeri Schneider, Tania Pinsamer, Andersen, and Ruth Ben Sakar. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, the Serpentine. Está bien. Está bien. Es un. Es el artista.